Hello and welcome to today's edition of Extraordinary Outcomes. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host and founder of Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Every discussion on B2B selling will bring this out at some point or the other. Sellers need to build trust with the buyer. However, we do not have the organic time that is required to build trust because that is how it is done naturally. Instead, we look for shortcuts. Unfortunately, there is no shortcut to building trust. Pitching gives you the ability to demonstrate respect and thus take the first step towards building trust. This begins with indicating to the prospect that you are taking a step back from one of the most aggressive techniques that has become the norm in B2B selling, surreptitious tracking of buyer behavior and invading the privacy of the prospect without consent. Pitchlink puts your prospect in charge of her data, including protecting the data of those she gets onto your pitch link. You do not get to see who the new persons on the thread are, although you see that it's indeed been shared by the recipient to whom you sent your pitch flow in the first place. Thousands of pitches are sent out on our platform bears testimony to this fact. Engagement went up with shared communication when prospects learned firsthand that senders and vendors will not see their activity and interaction with the received narrative without their the prospects clear and definite consent to build trust pitch link it want to know more sign up for a free one on one session link in the attachments We continue our series of conversations with authors who wrote seminal books on sales that helps us understand the buyer better. Our guest today is Tony Hughes. Tony is co-founder and sales innovation director at Sales IQ Global. He serves on advisory boards and has been published by the American Management Association. Tony has also taught sales for Sydney University, University of New South Wales and within the MBA program at the University of Technology Sydney. We speak with him about his brand new book Tech Powered Sales which he co-authored with Justin Michael Tony welcome to the show I'm I'm delighted to have you with us especially because this is such a important book and such a timely book I I can't say enough well uh, welcome Thank you Sapanjan it's uh, so good to be on the show uh, there's never been a book like this written before so it was an epic feat to get it done Absolutely uh before we actually dive into the book uh, t- tell us a bit about your work I mean I'm sure people who are listening to this know a lot about you but but touch upon the highlights uh, you formed a new company uh, in in 2019 so uh, what what prompted you to create sales iq so tell us a bit about what you are doing yes yeah, so i've i've got 35 years three and a half decades of experience in selling and sales leadership the last sort of 12 years of my corporate career uh, i led the asia pacific region as ceo for north american multinationals About ten years ago, I left uh, the corporate leadership world uh, and went out on my own as a consulting consulting to CEOs and sales organisations. I specialise in working in the technology and professional services sectors uh, and help people solve their sales problems. And if we think about selling, there's really three main phases of selling. There's opening, which is without doubt the most difficult and the most important phase of selling. There's then the middle part of the sales process, uh, creating progression uh, and solutioning and getting a good proposal in. And then the last phase of selling is is really the closing piece. Uh, Now, I know the focus needs to be on customer success. So our our focus should be on the customer being successful in what we're doing for them, not just in closing the sale. But what I've increasingly found is that although I do a lot of work with organisations in India, uh, in countries throughout Asia, in Europe, North America, and obviously here in Australia, where I'm based, although I do work around account management and, and customer success, and then also strategic selling, so managing the strategic complex enterprise opportunity, what I found is the number one problem everybody says they have from the CEO all the way down to the individual contributing salesperson They all tend to say, hey, look, I know how to sell or we're okay as an organization in progressing opportunities. We just don't have enough of them. (laughs) We just don't have enough opportunity pipeline. So that was why uh, about three years ago, I wrote Combo Prospecting, uh, which was the idea of pattern interrupting the way that people are wired to ignore sellers or marketers to find a way to break through. 
and the logical follow-up to combo prospecting, um, which is really this book here. Yes. The logical follow-up to that book was tech-powered sales because uh, combo talked about the principles, but we deliberately did not provide a lot of specific detail on how to execute. And the reason that we avoided doing that was inevitably everybody just starts doing the same things they read about in the book, mm. and that in of itself makes it ineffective, right? The moment people are using the same techniques, the same language, uh, it just stops working. So we wanted people to apply their own human creativity. But in tech-powered sales, we've just recognized that now uh, field, all field selling has now become inside sales, remote selling, uh, and the the world is increasingly being eaten by software. Mm. You know, technology is just is staggering. Uh, you know, the rate of acceleration and and marketing technology stacks, martech stacks, are now blending with sales tech stacks. Uh, and everybody now needs to develop a level of EQ. We've always known that you need a high or reasonable IQ to be successful in selling. You definitely need very high EQ emotional quotients, you need to be able to read others and manage politics well and manage your own strengths and weaknesses. But increasingly today, you need TQ, you need technical quotient, you have to be able to adapt to using a tech stack. So that was what really uh, caused me to write the book. And I partnered up with a gentleman by the name of Justin Michael out of the USA. And he is without doubt, uh, the most insane level of genius when it comes to mashing up different technologies to find a way as an individual to do the work of hundreds uh, in going to market and selling. And the challenge for all of us is how do we embrace tech without being seen as a spammer and without, without damaging our own brand? So and that was a long answer to the question. No, no, it's a great answer because it triggers so many questions right off the gate. Uh, the first one, let's, let's uh, focus on Justin for a moment because you wrote about that experiment that he did. Walk us through that backstory. Yeah, so... Um, Justin's had a lot of different roles in sales, and he's always had a passionate level of curiosity on how to crack the code for the top of funnel. He was recruited by a company that subsequently got acquired, and what they wanted to do was to, in essence, model his brain and his approach to pipeline creation to automate as much as possible. Mm. So when we think about driving automated outbound uh, there's a new category of technology called sales engagement platforms. Hmm. So companies like Ring DNA, uh, Sales Loft, Outreach, uh, within the Salesforce product, they've got a thing called HVS, high velocity selling or high velocity sales inside Salesforce. But what all of these platforms are designed to do is to is to automate. Uh, sequences of outreach and messages across multiple channels within within the, the most desirable cadence. So uh, they tried to map the way he thinks and executes. And what we know is personalization is key. So what you want is short, sharp messaging. It's highly personalized and relevant. So as soon as they open, that, uh, open this up, they can see contextualized relevance and they can see why this would matter to them. It's about something they care about. Uh, and then you, you drive this across multiple channels. So they were looking uh, to uh, embrace what, what has subsequently been called the concept of liquid syntax, the idea of taking a very fluid approach to injecting personalization based on noticing attributes. Now, very few technologies or people execute that well. I've, I've seen these automated emails come to me. Hey, Tony, I noticed that we're both based in Sydney you know, would it make sense to catch up for a chat? And I'm thinking, well, there's 5 million people live in Sydney. I have no <laughs> idea why the fact we live in the same city is the reason why we'd want to talk. If that, like, so, that, so that's an ineffective nonsense piece of automated. And all they've done is they've scraped LinkedIn hmm. and they found the city that I'm based in and they thought, I'll play back that city, right? So you can try and play back their favourite sporting team, the university they went to, the city they're based in. <laughs> You know, the most recent post they published, you know, play back the heading of the post. Hey, Mike, I noticed you just published an article, you know, on why fireflies glow. You know, would it make sense for us to have a conversation about improving your sales results? You know, you go, well, you know, how, how does any of this make sense? <laughs> right. So so you can very easily uh, damage your own brand and get blocked 
uh, if you automate inappropriately. And, and, that's, and that's what we discuss at length uh, in, in the book, Tech Powered Sales. And w- what happened to that experiment? So did, did they sort of arrive at some, uh, you, you're talking about the fluid. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it was highly successful. Actually, I will share the name. The name of the company was Outbound Works. So Outbound Works. Hmm. And um, uh, they, were, they were automating. A lot of it was truly automated, but there was also a lot of mechanical Turk hmm. things going on in the background as well. Right. Um, and our view is about 70% of what a seller does today can be automated. Um, uh, and what all humans need to do is to focus on the, the, the elements of their role that add the most value as a person. So, you know, things like creativity, um, navigating politics, helping someone secure consensus, uh, all of these kinds of things are what make a real a real difference in engagement. Help someone go and build their business case and, and get that across the line internally. They're not things that AI can do. Whereas what technology can do really well is it can listen for trigger events in the marketplace that make you relevant to a buyer uh, based on your ideal customer profile. So you can point technology into where there's the highest propensity to buy and then point technology at listening for things that go on in the marketplace that give you context for a conversation to make you relevant to the buyer. And then it can serve you that in a lead funnel along with their mobile, their cell phone number, mobile phone number, and their email address. And it can even look for, you know, where's, where, where's the best path here? Is there a common relationship? So there's all these technologies out there that are able to do this. And the, the best sellers need to embrace that to improve both their effectiveness uh, and their efficiency. So they need to get good at the right things, not become good at the wrong things, but and, and really leverage tech. Great. So Great. let's uh, let's get into the the point where you and Justin decided that you know what it's important to write a book on this now. When yeah. was that? Oh, that would have been about two years ago. So combo combo had been had been out for a year. Hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I'd I'd always wanted to 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 credit Justin in combo prospecting, but he just wanted to stay under the radar given everything that he was doing. And uh, and he said he'd be willing to co-author a book. And I said, well, the thing that'll be great is you and I, Justin, are so different. We've been very different perspectives to solving the problem of top of funnel pipeline creation. Um, so let's bring old school and new school, this sort of eclectic approach, uh, but weave it together in a really compelling way. So Justin and I sim- simply sat down and Justin's got insane, incredible levels of, of tactics and strategies for execution. And what we said is, well, we need to frame this up in an ethical framework. Hmm. And then we talked about, um, the moral imperatives in how you operate as a seller uh, and the fact that you need to create uh, a conversation narrative that's all about the other person, it's not about you. Um, but we talk about the the ethical perspectives on using publicly available data, you know, to be able to get hold of people. So it was let's create an ethical construct and then these insane levels of how you could go and execute. And I, I had one CEO uh, call me out of the blue, he'd read the book, bought and read the book. Um, uh, actually, it's this guy here. I'll hold this up. Um, this guy is called Warwick Kirby. Yeah. Uh, and he's 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 written a book, Startups. It's a blood sport. He'd be a good mm. guy for you to interview on, sure. uh, on your podcast if you want to provide an introduction. Absolutely. Warren, what Warren runs a global software company. He rang me and said before he read Tech Powered Sales, he would have given himself about an eight and a half, nine out of ten for how he, how he was running his global sales organization. Hmm. He read the book and said, I now give myself a six and a half out of 10. Hmm. He said, there is so much actionable content in here that he hadn't even thought about. And that's what we really wanted to give people, this gift where you can just take a couple of ideas in the book and run with them and they'll make a massive difference. Right, right. How did you collaborate between yourself and Justin? How, what was the division of labor like? Yeah, so 
Justin was all into the individual tactics typically. Hmm. And then we've both got a very big network of people we respect. You talked hmm. about Aaron Ross, right? right? So, so, you know, like, uh, we, we both know Aaron Ross really well. We both know Mary Lou Tyler. Well, hmm. um, we course. both know Mark Hunter, Anthony Norino, Jeb, Jeb Blunt, who wrote fanatical prospecting. Yes. Um, you know, it's a small industry. So what we did is we, we created a Google doc hmm. and we, we shared it with a lot of people and we, we said, just pre- please treat this under as if you're under NDA. Uh, and we and we have people like one person commented and said, you know, this book should be burned. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this this board is on unethical. Now, this this was before, you know, we'd got in there and created the the moral framework for right. using these hmm. these tactics ethically. But we had a lot of people just contribute and we've attributed source all through the book. So there's a there's a lot of references to other people. Hmm. But what, what we decided to do was the thing we know is you need to lead with why. Why is something important? And and people people only truly remember something and they're only truly motivated for reasons they themselves discover. So if they discover it, they'll tend to retain it. They'll tend to own it. Whereas if you just preach at people and tell them, it just tends to wash over people. So the first part of the book really talks about why this is so critical. So we talk about the fact that we believe one third of field selling roles are disappearing this decade. We talk about the fact that there's a great disruption. In America, they're talking about the great resignation. A lot of people are deciding to resign and leave their employer based on the way they were treated in the first 18 months of the pandemic that we've all been dealing with. So the first part of the book, we talk about, you know, why this is so important, right? Many jobs are disappearing. Yeah. Sales is not immune. If you can't work effectively with technology today, you're, you're, a, you're a dead person walking. You know, your career's over. You just don't know it yet. No one's actually tapped you. Mm. But you have to find a way to create the necessary level of value for your customer and your employer to fund your role. And that means you must you must get good at working with technology. So the first part of the book is all about that. Hmm. Then we jump in and we talk about the essential tech stack, yeah. right? So when you think about, well, what's what's the minimum essential tech stack? What's then the optional tech stack that I could add to that? And then, then we address the issue of, well, there's no point using all of this tech if you haven't nailed your message well, nailed your narrative, your, your value narrative. So we explain exactly how to do that and provide a framework. We then talk about the importance of personalization and referrals and trigger events are the superpower in selling. If you can combine them together, it's a superpower in selling. So we talk about trigger events. We explain what they are, how you can monitor for them at every step of the way, giving examples with technology. And then we just provide a whole lot of examples of how you can do this. Uh, And then toward the end of the book, uh, we, we actually paint a picture of a day in the life of tomorrow. So we actually show a sales scenario that's very futuristic. And the punchline is every single thing the person just read about, every single thing without exception can be done today, hmm. including AI bots that phone people and confirm meetings. Yeah. AI bots that watch a Skype meeting or a Zoom meeting or a, a Teams meeting or a Blue Jeans meeting or a Google. Google Hangout or a Google Meet, and they're watching, and they can the AI can tell whether the person's being honest with you. Hmm. It can give you live coaching in the background about buying signals and talk time, and sentiment. So we paint, you know, we show this amazing futuristic story and say everything in this story is available today. The only thing that's missing is the orchestration layer to bring it all together, and that's where people need to be, in essence, the human middleware today. To, to, to pull their tech stack together to be effective. And then in the end of the book, we provide case study examples. So that new business I've started, Sales IQ Global, mm. which is a B2B sales enablement platform, uh, teaches people how to go and sell, uh, you know, build their, their ideal customer profiles, their buyer personas, their messaging, cadence sequences, in essence, playbooks. So uh, we're pulling together the best people in the world at Sales IQ Global. We've got an example of how Louis my co-founder at Sales IQ Global goes and sells. We actually publish that, right? So how we how we build out all of the messaging. Hmm. So so let's uh, uh, and unpack a bit about this ideal or a starting sales tech stack. What 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 is what does that look like? 
Yeah, so um, if we have a look today, um, most startup businesses are spending about $1,000 US per person in their sales organization on their tech stack. Mm. That's rapidly moving to $2,000, and we think it'll end up at $5,000 by the end of this decade. Uh, 5,000 US, that's a lot of money. You go, wow, you could hire a couple of employees in India for, for that for that kind of money. Um, but what will happen is that that tech stack will make the sellers superhuman. So what we say in the essential tech stack, it starts at the very beginning. Look, obviously, everybody needs a phone, <laughs> you know, so, so a smartphone. Everyone needs that. But we say, okay, so here's what really begins. You need CRM and marketing automation. So if you have something like Salesforce, it blends all, it can blend all of those together, right? So, but it might be Salesforce and Marketo. You know, you might, you know, use HubSpot if you're an entry-level business for basic CRM and marketing automation. But you need a single source of truth about your prospects and customers. It's essential and a way to get them into nurture campaigns and do email automation. It's really key. So that's the first thing, your CRM marketing automation tool. Next thing is you need uh, social network intelligence tools. So in most developed markets, that's Sales Navigator, Hmm. right? So so that's Sales Navigator. Um, So that's where you can go and you can learn about someone. You can you can connect with them. You can get some real insights into the person. So that's the networked intelligence with social platform piece. The third thing we recommend, if you're a business that's driving scale. Uh, are these sales engagement platforms, what we call an SEP. So that's Outreach, Sales Loft, um, Ring DNA, Groove, Zant, Apollo, um, Lemlist, um, uh, and then within products like HubSpot, Marketo, Salesforce, they'll have that capability as well. But basically, how do I build uh, a cadence and sequences to automate outbound prospecting? And, and at, an, at a software level kind of playbook, the way we're running outreach. And then, autom- you know, and, and, and what you'll hook into that is things like maybe parallel assisted dialers. That's another piece of technology we talk about in the, the essential stack. Um, the other thing you need is, is data enrichment, right? You need the right data. So, you know, we all know there's things like Zoom Info. Uh, there's a great platform here in Australia and Singapore called Trigger, Trigger.ai. But Zoom Info, a lot of recruiters use a product called Lucia. Um, things like 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 Rocket Reach, Lead IQ, uh, Discover All got bought by Zoom Info. So th- these are all platforms that provide, for example, for t- typically email addresses. The next thing, the next thing that's essential is trigger event monitoring because you want people running outreach where it's contextualized and relevant. And again, that platform, Trigger.ai, so T-R-I-G-G-R, so there's no E, Trigger.ai is an example. Zoom Info have a thing called Scoops. Um, LinkedIn Navigator, you can run saved searches. If you look at accounts and then setting up leads and running saved searches, Navigator can, can notify you. The interesting thing with Navigator is, on average, people update their LinkedIn profile not until six weeks after they've joined in, start joined a new organization and started a role. Mm. So often that trigger event notification is all a bit late. Um, and then the last things we'd recommend is um, dialing technology. So you can dial out of your CRM with a, you know, with a, with a headset. Um, parallel assisted dialers do the automated dialing in the background for you and just screen pop when someone answers. Yeah. Uh, but at the very least, just get some dialing tech that's integrated to CRM. Um, and then collaboration software, right? So we're all using Zoom today, for example. If you want to get yourself a good commercial account of things that help you do remote selling well. And that's and that's the essential stack, right? So, but remember at the most basic level, it's CRM with marketing automation. You'd want to have something like Sales Navigator. Hmm. Uh, and then you want to be able to monitor for trigger events to contextualize your outreach. And then if you're driving scale, Think about these auto dialers, um, dialing integration to CRM, and these sales engagement platforms that'll sort of automate your cadence and sequences. But just be wary, you can't load spam into your Gatling gun of automation. Because if you do that, you'll just damage your brand and get your domain blocked very quickly. 
you know, you have this list of questions which you have put in the book at the beginning, which says that if you answer no to any of these, uh, then then you need to read this book. So you're sort of running a qualifier for the book there. Yeah. And and I, I can pretty much tell you from the conversations that I have, 95% of people who read that list will say no to at least a few of those questions. Yeah. Uh, why, yes. why, while it is not... not Uh, not rocket science but it's true so my question is tech is not nothing new this mark tech uh, 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 landscape that scott binker has been doing is is in the making for like 10 years now Uh, sales tech landscapes which like nicholas kochowski's landscape came out just a few days back Uh, he he has now grown from nothing to 1100 products there and this is like a span of five years or something yeah why is it that there is no focus on actually learning these technologies? Because the, the, the training that you see out there is all about techniques. It's, it's mostly about the soft stuff, right? Yes. Uh, why is it that people are not sort of understanding that you need to get trained on, on these, these technologies and your ability to actually work with them uh, uh, in, in, in tandem? Subhanjan, that's a that's a great question. That is a great question. Most people treat their tech stack like a gym membership. You know, someone's paying the fee every month, but they hardly ever go, right? And the thing that makes my head explode is an organization, for example, will pay for LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Now, that's about $1,000 US per annum yes. for one person. It's yes. a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And you can go, like, if you, if you went to 100 people and you sat down beside them and said, hey, can you just show me? Let's, let, me let me sit here and just watch you work for a few minutes. Let's say that you were going to do a trip. And let's pretend COVID's over and we're back to traveling again, right? <laughs> so say, hey, let, let's pretend you're going to do a trip to Mumbai next month. Show me how you would use save searches in LinkedIn, in Navigator, to identify the best people to contact for that visit. Um, sh- show me how you'll identify the list of people that you want to go after. Um, most people look at you like from another planet. Right? They have, you know, or if you say to them, hey, look, fire up Google and show and show me how you would construct a saved Boolean search that's going to monitor for trigger events within your ICP. Right, so that you'll know who the ideal clients are to contact every time this trigger event happens. They have no idea how to set up a simple Boolean search. And the, the thing that staggers me is that if any of us watching this or listening to this podcast, if any of us were on the aero bridge about to board an aircraft, again, let's pretend COVID's over now, <laughs> you're, but you're on the aero bridge and as you step from the aero bridge into the uh, entry of the aircraft itself, the cockpit's on your left and the air crew are having a look at your boarding pass to see whether they'll let you on. And you overhear the pilot saying, hey, look, I love flying. I'm just not into the tech. (laughs) Right now, for me, for me, I would want to turn around and and walk back up the aero bridge, right? How can you be a good, effective, capable, safe pilot if, if you're not into the tech? Like it's all tech. You know, imagine if you went and saw your doctor and the doctor said, look, do you want me to diagnose the problem and give you a script or do you want me to fill in my patient record system? Right? I say, well, I want you to do both. You're a professional. Like, what, like, what, what do you mean? It's, it's diagnose and prescribe versus maintain your records. And yet so many sellers don't maintain their CRM. They don't have an agenda for the meeting. They don't take notes. They don't have, know how to use their tools of trade. Right. And yet sellers, crazy salespeople, think, oh, but I'm immune. I'm immune from all of this technology driven disruption. Right. Because I provide a relationship. Well, wake up. Do people who do not know you yet that could buy from you, are they looking for a relationship with a seller in their life? (laughs) No, (laughs) none of them are lonely and bored and looking for another friend from the sales world. None of them want a sales pitch. 
So, so the the value is not in the relationship. We we need a relationship for us to be successful because no one's going to buy from us unless there's trust, right? So we need that relationship for them to buy. But they're not looking for another relationship. Bigger companies want fewer suppliers to engage with. Yeah. They want more value from fewer vendors. So we have to find a way to create value, and and that's in our insights that we provide people. We need to move away from being from being tactical and transactional to being that trusted advisor, um, advisory kind of person in the world of the of the buyer. Right? We turn up with a point of view. We help them navigate the politics, build the business case, um, manage change risk. Right? We help them go and secure those things. Yeah. Um, that's 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 where the seller of the future needs to operate. But they'll be powered by technology. So one of the things I say in the very beginning of the book is that the future of selling is where uh, buyer sentiment meets seller relevance, and the matchmaking and the introduction is done by technology. Right, that's that. That's where this is going. So, as a seller, how do you configure your tech stack to start doing that for you? Opening is one of the biggest hurdles, which is why we 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 are sort of saddled with uh, junk leads, as they call it. Yeah. Right. Uh, what is your view? Because there is a contrarian view out there which says that salespeople should not be opening at all. It should be somebody else. In fact, you quote one of the CEOs who reacted to you saying, hey, I don't need the sales guys to open. I can use two inside sales guys to create opportunities uh, at yeah. the same same cost. So my question to you is, there is no, no debate on the fact that you need better leads, which means better opportunities identified. But is it something which can be separated out from the salesperson and, and somebody which is inside sales or whatever you call it, they run that process and hand over the qualified stuff for these guys to do the progression and the closing. Or is it something that the salesperson need to do? What's your view on that? So Banjan, all your questions are so good. So um, the organization in the world that is credited in being first to market with industrializing, you know, like the Henry Ford production model, industrializing the sales process is Salesforce. And that was chronicled in the book by Aaron Ross called yes. Predictable Revenue. Yes. And Mary Lou Tyler wrote the case study for that book around Salesforce themselves. So what they what they did is they said, well, let's segment the roles, right? Like what why would I have a very expensive mature field seller, hmm. why would I have them doing the lower value outbound pipeline building? And it's a very valid question, but there's something really interesting here. If you want a university grad to go and do all your outbound, and if they need to create messaging that talks the language of leaders and can engage the C-suite, and if they're going to need to get on the phone and open open the opportunity in the relationship with that phone call. The $64 million question is, can a uni grad carry the conversation with a CEO or a CFO? And I would argue normally, no, they can't. Absolutely. I and agree. that's, yeah. And that's, and that's where you need the senior field seller. They need to become their own. There's all these acronyms, right? ISR, SDR, BDR, <laughs> right? So the, this inside sales rep role, but AEs, field sellers, need to become their own SDR, BDR, ISR into the C-suite and then get the inside sellers running groundswell. So in essence, mapping the account, getting all of the sales intelligence data into CRM, ringing, calling into the more junior levels. People at lower levels are often freer with information, so you can you can find out a lot more, and really setting things up for the senior seller because you get one shot at the top. So I, I do believe in role specialization. I do believe in role specialization, but it's not that opening is one of the most difficult phases. It is without doubt the most difficult phase, and the way we open determines the probability of ever closing, and the way we open determines the velocity of the deal. Because when I think about qualifying a deal, it's not about, you know, do they have budget and authority and need and timeline and all of these other medic and med pick and nutcase and all of these other qualification acronyms. It, it's the degree to which the prospect 
will share insider information with us and access to other key stakeholders that determines whether we're likely to win. And you have to be able to engage at a level that can carry that conversation. So the senior people need to engage into the C-suite. This is fascinating. And, and what, what sort of this discussion is leaving me with is that I need to get back to you soon and have one more chat. Uh, uh, b- because sure. this opens up so many thoughts and uh, so many ideas uh, and I, I cannot uh, stress enough that I think we are missing out on some basics as we are transitioning into the fourth uh, phase of the how the world or business uh, uh, operates. Uh, there are many nuanced issues here uh, which need, need attention, need, need, uh, uh, need, need work upon. But uh, not mastering technology is definitely not an option. I agree, Subhanjan. I, I, I agree 100%. Um, everybody has to be tech savvy. So, so older, more experienced sellers and business leaders need to just, you know, get over the fact that they don't want to and it feels difficult, but just think, I'm, I'm going to embrace tech. I, I need to figure out how to use these things. And and as with everything in life, you know, once you roll up your sleeves and dive in, you go, oh, this actually wasn't as hard as I thought at all. Um, but certainly as a business leader, you need to understand how you can use capital applied to technology to augment and sometimes replace capital applied to labor because it's going to get you uh, a, a, a much better effect. Justin Michael talks about the fact that, you know, we, you know, we can all try and outrun the lion, <laughs> Right, and they well, I mean, I can run faster than you, so I'll be okay because the lion will eat you. But you know, what what if you manage to to get yourself a moped? <laughs> hmm. You know, it, it doesn't matter how fast the other runner is; you've got a better piece of technology that's going to get you way ahead of them, and the lion's going to eat them. Yeah. And and that's the same with business today. All of these, there's a bewildering array. Justin Michael describes it as a Cambrian explosion of sales tech. And everybody's thinking, it's just all bewildering. You know, which pieces do I need to embrace and grab? And in the book, we explain how you, how you can take yourself on that journey in, in, a, in a pragmatic, digestible, and executable way, right? You look at the essential stack and you think, you know what? I'm going to learn how to build a dashboard in, in my CRM, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to automate a campaign with email, I'm going to learn how to configure one of these sales engagement platforms. I'm going to learn how to build a saved Boolean search in the LinkedIn Sales Navigator wizard that I can run regularly that'll tell me who I should be calling, right? I'm going to learn how to get a Chrome plugin, you know, that gives me phone numbers and email addresses. So I'm not, I'm not just sending an email to places that get blocked and ignored, right? So people can just knock, just tick those things off one by one if you make a 1% improvement every day, every week, before you know it, you'll be the best person in your industry. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Abhanjan. I appreciate it. Thank you. One of the biggest challenges facing sales organizations is efficiently leveraging technology. We spoke with Tony Hughes last week, and this week we speak with Nikolaj D. Kochkovsky, author of The Sales Technology Landscape, to help you make sense of where this explosive growth in sales tech products is headed. So I think from a communication standpoint, asynchronous ways of communicating are embraced by buyers and actually sellers, <laughs> by I would say consumers at large, across B2B and B2C. Uh, that's, that's a convenience of a conversation. Uh, there's no more weight. You have the persistence of the conversation and context. So all this had started, not only in sales, but in service across 
every motions of customer engagement. So this is not changing. It's going to, uh, to continue. Um, what I see is an evolution vis-a-vis -vis self service versus assisted service. It's very interesting because in the B2B space, the focus was assisted selling, right? Uh, there's always a seller. And what we see is growingly B2B purchases that are shifting to a completely virtual model through app exchange, app stores. There's more and more uh, B2B purchase decisions that are entirely digital from the standpoint of being self-service. We are very excited about the upcoming launch of our new community built to bridge the gap between buyers and sellers, Moxo. It is designed for buyers, sellers, and marketers to enable access to curated content, share ideas, and engage in conversations as a community. The space will be invite only. And if you want in, please write to us at moxo at pitch.link. That is M-O-X-O -O at pitch.link. Time to wrap up for today. You will soon have access to the complete interviews in the Fixing the 5% Conversion Problem in V2E Sales and transcripts in the series. Keep an eye out for the link in the EXO newsletter. And thank you for watching. Until next time, stay well and craft extraordinary outcomes.